Thank you for joining us. This, as you know, is uh, the, there's a little bit of a change that happened. This this breakout session is transgender in, transgender in the Bible, picking up the pieces, as you can see on the screen. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I was sitting on the couch reading my wife's face as she was reading my sermon. It was the first sermon I had ever preached, and I just knew that she was going to love it because she loves all of my writing. I had all the parts, all the right parts and all the right places, and it was just, a, just the right mix of humor and advice. And, uh, and besides, Julie, Julie has, has a habit of, of being good at tweaking little things here and there. So I just let her take a look at it before, before we uh, finalized it. It's a product of many weeks of work. I had worked so long and hard, and in two short days, I was going to be presenting this sermon. So while Julie looked at it, I sat in anticipation and watched her. And then she looked up at me, and she just shook her head. It's not right. Oh, well, okay. That's fair. What part do I need to fix? And she said, all of it. And just like that, weeks worth of effort started to wilt in her fingertips. I needed to scrap the entire thing and start all over. Just be real, she said. Just get up there and show them who you really are. That's what they want. Have you ever had something like that happen? Where you put so much work into something only to have to be told that you're going at it the entirely wrong way? The happy ending to this story, though, is that the sermon that I ended up preaching two days later, after sleepless nights and long hours of writing, changed the entire direction of my life. It sparked a passion inside me for ministry, and it sent me to Earlham School of Religion in Richmond, Indiana, where I earned a Master's of Divinity degree in 2013. Since then, I have preached more sermons, and I've led workshops uh, about various aspects of the transgender experience, both here in America and other countries as well. But none of that would have been possible if I hadn't taken the advice of my wife and changed the direction of my first sermon. I tell you this story because this workshop might be different than you're expecting. By the time we're done, you might discover that the way you've been fiercely defending your transgender loved ones all of this time has not really been the best way to go about it. And you might also discover that the best way to do it is a whole lot easier than you think. You don't have to memorize a stack of verses that counterattack the vicious haters. You don't have to practice a bunch of one-liners. You don't have to remember any complicated formulas. You just have to show up, be yourself, and let your heart lead you into meaningful relationship with people who need you. When I started in seminary in 2010, I had received a scholarship that paid for my tuition with the condition that I volunteer some of my time while I was at school. This is one of the things that makes Earlham School of Religion affordable for so many people who couldn't otherwise go to seminary. April was, and still is, the registrar for that school, so I spent many hours in her office volunteering and get, getting to know her. She mentored me through a variety of challenges that I experienced while I was in school, and we have been good friends ever since then. April graduated from Earlham School of Religion almost a decade before I did, and became a recorded Quaker minister. Her parents came to the United States as war refugees in 1960, six weeks before April was born. Her father was from Indonesia and her mother was from Holland. They were, they were sponsored to this country by Quakers in Indiana, who subsequently welcomed her family into their community and helped nurture April and her younger brother through childhood and into adulthood. April has a particular passion for diffusing the Bible when it's used as a weapon of mass destruction. Witnessing the hate and discrimination against her parents for having an interracial marriage has fueled her advocacy for people who live on the margins of acceptable society. 
This passion catapulted April into 27 years as a therapist and six years as a pastor. And now in addition to being the registrar at Earlham School of Religion, she has been leading Bible studies and workshops using her gifts to make complex ideas easier to understand. When I was born, I was named Brenda Ann, a name that means flame of grace. I was raised in a very conservative Baptist faith tradition in central Illinois. I was homeschooled for most of my life, and I was protected by what I call a Christian bubble, or in other words, a strictly regulated sphere of Christian influence. When I reached the age of 18, I had to start making some serious decisions about what kind of an adult I wanted to be. While I knew who I really was, I didn't know that transgender people even existed, so I came out to my family as lesbian. In my conservative faith tradition, I was told that I could not serve God as lesbian. So I left God at my parents' house, and I determined that I could get along without religion. Thank you very much. I learned how to drive an 18-wheeler when I was 22, and I set out on a life of travel and adventure. I put on a strong face in the light of all that had happened between God and me, saying I didn't need God anyway. I lived on the outskirts of religion for the next few years, but eventually I admitted that I so desperately wanted a relationship with God that I would try anything. I enlisted the help of a place called Love in Action, an ex-gay organization in Memphis, Tennessee. It was supposed to be a two-year residential program but it was only two weeks before I bolted. To this day, I have not completely articulated all of the psychological damage and emotional damage that was done to me at Love in Action. If anyone in this room has ever been through a program like that, then you'll know the damage I'm talking about. Sometimes it's easier for those of us who are gay or transgender to deny ourselves an authentic life so that we can hold on to the life we built with our loved ones. Most of us, when given a choice whether or not to live authentically, have a list of people that we know for certain will reject us. Perhaps some of you have had to make that very dis same decision in order to come out as gay or lesbian. It's not an easy choice, but many trans transgender people have had to do just that. In March of 2005, after years of denying my true self, I finally started my physical trans transformation from female to male. Let me tell you, my decision to transition was the best one I had ever made. Puberty is hard when you're young, but puberty at 32 is fantastic. <laughs> the day I got my first shot of testosterone, I started recording my voice so that I could keep track of the changes that it would make over the next several weeks and months. My vocal cords thickened, causing my voice to plummet and landing me in the bass section of the choir. In a matter of months, my face was sprouting more hair than I knew what to do with, and I started losing the hair on my head. Actually, I didn't lose it. It relocated. It was like a stiff breeze came along and blew it off my head and onto my back. <laughs> I was finally at peace with myself, and it was wonderful. Parker Palmer wrote, what a long time it can take to become the person one has always been. So what does all of this have to do with the Bible? That is why you've come to this breakout session today, right? To understand what the Bible has to say about people who identify as transgender. What I can tell you right now is that the Bible never addresses people who are transgender. Thank you for coming. It was, <laughs> that's the end. Now, in fact, it never even acknowledges that uh, transgender people exist. We absolutely did exist. I can, I'm confident of that. But if we are scouring the scriptures looking for direct references, we won't find any. As April likes to point out, it also never acknowledges that Asian people exist. If we use the Bible to inform our positions on every possible situation we encounter in our modern lives, I'm sorry to say that we will, there will be a number of gaps that people will turn themselves into pretzels trying to bridge. 
But does that mean that the Bible is of no use to us in this conversation? Absolutely not. For as many people who have used the Bible as a weapon to attack whole groups of people, just as many people have used the Bible as a balm to heal and affirm whole groups of people. In fact, there are several books that we like to use as reference about how the Bible can be a book of hope and love for the transgender community. Let me tell you more. In the book of Genesis, there is a narrative about how God created the world and everything in it. The traditional view that you and I grew up hearing was that God painstakingly separated things into a binary categories. The day from the night, the earth from the sky, the land from the sea, and so on. In the same way we learned God separated humanity into two binary categories, male and female. In many faith traditions, creation is seen to follow a divine pattern of this versus that, particularly male versus female. And being transgender falls outside God's original plan for creation. But in his book, Transgender, Justin Tannis invites us to examine the creation narrative more closely. The language that is used in Genesis does show some one-sided commands. For instance, God said, let there be day and night, let there be earth and sky, let there be land and sea, and so on. God gives a series of commands, and the creation responds in unquestioned obedience. But then something changes. Tannis points out that when God decides to create humankind, there is a change in tone. It's almost like this was God's favorite part that he was looking forward to the most. In verse 26, God says, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Do you notice the difference there? We're a demonstration of God's artistic nature. And so there needed to be an invitation to mutual creativity. We're invited to see beyond the binary categories and participate with God in seeing diversity as beautiful and amazing. Before we move away from the creation narrative, let's go back to the beginning and find the part where God divided the day from the night. If we were to adhere to a strict interpretation of this passage, we might think that the lights go out instantly when the clock strikes 9 p.m. If this were truly a binary manifestation, we would have daylight, and then we would have darkness, and ne'er the twain shall mingle. But that's not what we have, do we? Clearly, God allows for some ambiguity. Even in the things that seem so cut and dry, there are, like, there are many hours in the Earth's rotation around the sun where we could say that day and night exist at the same time. Likewise, there are plenty of species that would, be, that would defy the binary def distinction of mammal and fish. And no scientist would ever contend that the earth and the land were distinct from each other when you consider the mountains and valleys that exist under the sea and the waves that crash onto the shore, infusing the sand with the ocean's DNA. And while we're at it, let's talk about the binary assumption between plant and animal. Coral is a widely considered underwater, is widely considered an underwater plant. It looks like a plant, but corals are in fact massive colonies of tiny little animals called polyps. So you see, it is not God who is afraid of ambiguity. And when creation, the creation narrative describes how God created male and female, it leaves out the amazing diversity that comprises the natural spectrum, the dusks and the dawns of human gender. It puts limits on God's creativity that are not God's limits, but our own. One of the chapters in the book, Trans Faith, explores the relationship between the ancient eunuch and the modern transgender community. Many transgender people have found hope and, com and comfort in the intersections found, the differentness that they find with the eunuch. 
Furthermore, they receive affirmation from the way that Jesus talked about the, the, the eunuch in the book of Matthew and the eunuch's role in the kingdom of God. But the book also points out that there are certain limitations to this analogy. The analogy between eunuch and transgender person is almost always a physical one. And many transgender people choose not to physically change their bodies. While as a general rule, eunuchs were given roles as servants, there were others who held positions of great power. But most trans people do not hold prestigious positions in our modern society. There are some eunuchs mentioned in the Bible who are portrayed as scheming, conniving manipulators, and some are even villains. And these might not be the kind of people that trans people want to model after in today's society. And finally, when we hear about eunuchs in the, in the Bible, we're always reading about people who were assigned the male gender at birth, which some transgender and non-binary people cannot relate to. When April introduced me to this book, she urged me to read chapter five to see what I thought about a different role model for the modern transgender seeker of biblical affirmation. They urge us to consider the story of Job. If you're familiar with the book of Job, you've probably heard it used to illustrate tremendous suffering endured by a righteous man. Job had been a man of great wealth and prominence until suddenly, for no fault of his own, he lost everything. The transgender community is all too familiar with suffering and extreme loss, just because we decide to be honest with our families or with our coworkers or our fellow church members all, and all our neighbors about who we really are. In the second chapter of Job, he's affected with visible sores that immediately identified him as other. Many transgender women tell stories of having to sit in a pew by themselves in church since no one will sit with them. The less they are read by others as female, the more people will treat them as an imposter and shun them. They feel conspicuous and awkward based solely on how they look. The, com the common wisdom of Job's day was that if, if a person was experiencing great suffering and loss, they must have done something to make God angry. Job's friends implored him to repent of whatever it was that made God angry and to seek forgiveness so that he could experience relief from the torment, from both his physical pain and his social ousting. Instead of getting clear about what was really going on, Job's friends came to him and said, obviously you did something to deserve this or else it wouldn't be happening. For transgender people who are ridiculed, ostracized, abused, raped, and even murdered, we are often blamed for bringing it on ourselves. Well, if you wouldn't dress like a girl, or if you wouldn't try to use the women's bathroom, or if you wouldn't wear so much makeup, then this wouldn't be happening. Job was at a loss for an explanation. The pain and the isolation he felt in the midst of his extreme suffering and loss and loneliness was becoming more than he could bear. He knew that he had done nothing wrong, but the pressure of judgment and blame was closing in on him, and he just wanted to die. This is the way that so many transgender people feel, and some of them decide to put an end to it all. It's not because they are uncertain of who they are, but because they cannot go on living a lie. And they also cannot bear the pain of living their truth. The people around them offer, offer scorn and rebuke instead of love and affirmation. Fortunately, the book of Job does not end in suicide. Finally, God steps in and, express, and exposes Job's religious friends as pious fools. In the end, they are the ones who must repent and seek forgiveness. Because Job made it through and did not give in to the crushing weight of suffering and loss, he was able to experience the fullness of life again. Indeed, even more than he had experienced before. 
Many times when transgender people are given support, affirmation, and validation, we discover that living a life of authenticity is far more rewarding than living a life of fear and conformity. In her book, Transgender Journeys, Virginia Mollencott writes, we who are gender variant are, like all human beings, complex and unique. Society considers us to be nonconformist, cultural rebels who somehow manage to transcend the usual categories of gender. To the exasperation of gender traditionalists, we remain human beings who are created in the image of God, which makes us intrinsically valuable and eternally loved by our creator. We are indeed, as the psalmist wrote, fearfully and wonderfully made. Good afternoon. So, as part of my introduction, um, Brent spoke about my parents coming to this country as refugees. Holland colonialized Indonesia for almost 400 years, and I am the last generation that is the product of that colonialization. So, I will be talking about post-colonial theory in my section. And another part of my introduction is that I have white privilege. I'm not white, but I have white privilege. I am straight, heterosexual, cisgender. And Brent and I do this workshop together as an oppressor and oppressed so that everyone in the room can have someone to relate to. So what I'm going to talk about is picking up the pieces. And which pieces to pick up? I'd like to quote Nancy Bowen, who is the Old Testament professor at our seminary. No argument has ever been won by making an appeal to scripture. Now I'm gonna repeat that because this is really important. No argument has ever been won by making an appeal to scripture. We argue about the kingdom of heaven. What does it look like? Is it here? Is it now? Is it there? Is it then? You can find anything in the scripture to let you know. Leadership roles. Can women do that? Married men? Single men? I don't know. And we argue back and forth. Atonement. There are four different atonement theories in the scripture that you can pick out as to why Jesus died on the cross. Baptism. Do we baptize them when they're young, when they're babies? Do we wait until they're the age of reason? Can you baptize them again? Communion, do we do it once a week? Do we do it every time we come together? Do we sit at a table? Do we use real wine? Do we not? Or be like Quakers and we just don't do it at all? The Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father? Or does the Holy Spirit proceed from the, from the Son? And that argument caused the first split in the church between the Catholics and the Greek Orthodox, who are now Greek Orthodox. Salvation, what does it mean? Is it works? Is it belief? Is it both? Heaven and hell, does it even exist? What does it look like? And the end times, is there a rapture? Is there not? Do people really pick up weapons or do they not? We have argued about these things for centuries and no one has won because all we've done is split and split and split. I can't keep up with the denominations, can you? It could very well be that there are times that we are simply asking the Bible the wrong question. We ask the Bible, who? Who is in and out? Who belongs? And maybe what we need to ask is how? Now, all along scripture, we certainly aren't the first ones who ask who. I'm going to bring up what many consider to be one of the most boring books in the Bible, and it's called Chronicles. And if you ever slog through Chronicles, you'd pull your hair out. But 
Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles were written at the same time after the Babylonian exile. And they are coming back to reestablish Israel. Ezra, and Nehemiah is about bringing back this pure Israel. Who is an Israelite and who is not? And at that point in time, after they were taken into the exile, not everyone was. There was a whole bunch of Israelites that were left over. And the Persians were really slick. What they did with leftover Israelites is they started moving in all kinds of other people who were conquered so that they could water down the culture. Now they're doing the same thing in Tibet today, right? So, Ezra and Nehemiah, they come back in there and they say, divorce, these mixed marriages are against what God wants. Divorce your wives, we've got to be pure. The chronicler comes in and says, you know what? This is who we are. This is what we look like today. We've got mixed marriages. We've got all kinds of people calling themselves Israel. Let's just move forward with who we have and establish this kingdom that we're supposed to do. It wasn't a compromise on society. It was a critique of the Ezra and Nehemiah that they were saying, mm -mm, this is who Israel is. We asked the same question though, who is Christian? And we have this litmus test of all these questions that we ask that makes us in or out. Going back to Isaiah and the eunuchs, okay? To the eunuchs, and in later verses, the foreigner, who keep my Sabbaths and who choose things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. To quote Mr. Austin Harkey from his book Transforming, God didn't ask the eunuchs to pour themselves into the mold of Israel's previous societal norms, just like the chronicler doesn't ask anybody to go in either nor to bend themselves to fit by taking on specifically gendered roles in the current system. Instead, God called for a transformed community that looked like nothing people had ever seen. So, the eunuch and Philip. Are people familiar with this story? So Philip goes, this is in Acts chapter 8, Philip goes, and on the road for, to Gaza, he comes in contact with an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, this Ethiopian eunuch had gone in to worship at the temple, and he was coming back, and he was reading Isaiah. Now, this is in the time after Jesus. And the, Philip asked the eunuch, do you understand what you're reading? And Philip gets up into the chariot and he begins to talk to the eunuch and interpret what this scripture of Isaiah means. And then the eunuch commands the chariot to stop and he says, what's to stop us from you baptizing me right here and now? And he stops that chariot and Philip baptizes him. We tell this story as it is, a, I've heard it interpreted as the, the conversion of the Gentiles or the beginning of the North African churches. But if we look closely, since the time of Isaiah, eunuchs have been in. Here is a member of the Israelite community who is still treating a eunuch as if they're out. This is a double conversion story because Philip had to convert to believe that the eunuch was okay to be baptized. What this is a story of is God's people telling God's people that they don't belong. Does this sound familiar? So 
So let's dissect some of these pieces. In Western philosophy, Western philosophy and theology is based on binaries. You have either a body or a soul. You're good or bad, black and white, flesh and soul. Plato believed that the, our flesh was a prison. Paul speaks very harshly about our flesh. The LGBTQ plus community gets a double whammy when it comes to flesh. Because if my flesh as a cisgender heterosexual woman is bad, can you imagine what your flesh is going to make you do? But listen to what Bible says. Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. This flesh is what God breathed into and created. And the word became flesh and lived among us. Flesh is not vile. We need to claim our flesh. There's a theologian by the name of Myra Rivera at Harvard, and she wrote a book called Poetics of the Flesh. And there is a, a Quaker philosopher who was from Canada, Grace Jansen, who talks about claiming our flesh because it is in our flesh that I experience you as someone darker than me. We experience each other as African American, Latinx, Asian American, other, white European American, where we experience our, each other as heterosexual, lesbian, bisexual, non-binary, transgender. All those things have to do with this flesh where we experience our incredibly beautiful differences. So working and picking up the pieces to claim that flesh. Mr. Hart again talks about we who have spent a lot of time doing something called apologetics, which is the scriptural or theological defense of an idea. And because Christians have spent so long vilifying LGBTQ people Christ, um, and using scripture to make their point, queer Christians have had to engage with this very same scripture passage in order to defend themselves. The problem comes when LGBTQ Christians begin to feel as if their faith is made up of only apologetics and defense mechanisms, which is the way the oppressor keeps you stuck. You need to recognize that that's the way people like me or people who, who are from my kind keep you stuck in your spirituality. There is in post-colonial theory the idea that if your defense follows the same logic and the same structure as the attack, the only thing you're doing is you are supporting the oppressor and their structure. Walk with me. You know these arguments. This verse says you're out. You go to conferences ad nauseum to find the verses that say this verse says I'm in. This verse says you're bad, but you know all the verses that think you're good, that say you're good. You, this verse says you're an abomination. And you find all the verses that say you are loved. If the defense follows the same logic and structure and the attack as the attack, it is the logic and structure of the attack that's being fed. It is an argument set up by the oppressors and the majority that you are set up to lose. 
and be struck and stuck. Because it can't be effective, and this comes from Derrida, who's an Algerian philosopher. From the crisis of teaching philosophy. And in this, we have this French Algerian philosopher who is, he speaks at an African philosophy conference. And he begins to recognize how ridiculous it is that he is flying to Africa to teach Africans African philosophy. So, because it cannot, this, this argument and defense cannot be effective, because it, it, and it can't be a reversal, it's just a simple reversal. It doesn't work. It simply does not work. And it keeps you trapped in an argument that you did not construct. So, instead of arguing with them, about these verses, call upon your allies to do that. I don't call myself an ally because that's an honorific that is taken, is given. It is not for me to say that I'm an ally, it is for some of you in this room to say I am, if I am. But it is our job, those of us that are cisgender and straight, to argue these verses, if that's what's needed because you see, I am not damaged by these verses. I'm already in. It is not for you to re-damage yourself by arguing this. It's not your responsibility. It's mine. So twist free from the attack and from the impression and from the colonialization Feed your spiritual lives not based on the defense and defense only, but rather on the abundance of who God made you, who you are, and what God has given you. So leave those pieces lay. And when the oppressor hands those pieces to you, leave them laying on the ground. Don't play the game. Don't re-injure yourself. I want to close with a personal story about what happened when I decided to pick up different pieces. <clears throat> Before my transition, when I was still presenting as lesbian, one of the few times I tried to go straight, I had grown frustrated with all of the mixed messages that I was getting. On one hand, I was hearing Christians say that I was living in sin, that my lesbian behavior was an abomination, and that God would never allow me to be happy as a lesbian. And that the only way I was allowed to love someone was if that someone was a man. On the other hand, I was hearing from my gay friends that being lesbian was not a barrier to serving God and that God didn't care if I loved a woman. Back and forth, I was pulled. I wanted to believe my gay friends, but my Christian friends were telling me things I had heard all of my life. Finally, in desperation, I sat on the couch and I opened my Bible, determined not to budge until I had the answer straight from the pearly gates. The more I flipped the pages, the more stubborn I became. My heart was being pulled in too many directions and I needed an answer. Who was I supposed to love? With one final turn of the page, I read these words. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. It occurred to me in that moment that I had been asking the wrong question. It was not a question of what fellow human that I love. 
The right question was whether my heart belonged to God. Everything else was insignificant in light of what was truly important to me and to God in that moment. That realization opened the door for a huge decision that I would have to make a few years later. I had to ask myself, at what point would I stop arguing with my friends and my family and just be the authentic person I knew myself to be? In the story of Job, we see a person who knows who he is, no matter what anyone says, and who remains steadfast amidst the torment and the turbulence. Nothing his friends can tell him will make him confess, confess to sins that he didn't commit. But I was not Job. Every time someone told me I was sinning, I believed it. And I confessed to phantom sins. And I believed it some more. And I confessed some more. I was tossed and turned by the influence of the church, the influence of my culture, the influence of my friends. I needed to stop living in defense and start living in abundance. There's another presentation that I give on occasion called Fearless Authenticity, the story of my life in which I talk about coming out to my parents as transgender and facing the consequences of their grief. They tried to talk me out of it, but I had made up my mind. I was picking up different pieces. I was going to be my authentic self, and they would either love me through it or not. My parents were devastated by my decision, and they had turned away from me, saying that they just could not walk this journey beside me. I was incredibly sad, but to be honest, I wasn't surprised. My parents are good people, and they are also lifelong, devout, independent Baptist people whose religion does not allow for anything outside of traditional gender norms. Without taking a lot of time with the story, let me just say that over the course of these years since my transition in 2005, my parents and I have learned a lot about love, about grace, and about not giving up. I was living more authentically than I ever had lived before, and they got a chance to witness that. Eight years after my transition, I graduated from Earlham School of Religion and my parents came to my graduation. For the first time since we had parted ways in 2005, they said that they were proud of me. I was taken aback since I had long given up thinking I'd ever hear those words from them again. They were still using female pronouns for me, and I knew that they would never call me their son, but they were proud of me. I would take what I could get and be grateful. A few months ago, my parents had a transition of their own. They moved from the home that they had loved for 30 years into a small apartment in a retirement village. I drove three hours every weekend for a month to help them sort and clean and pack and then donate, what their, to, uh, donate whatever their kids and their grandkids didn't want. On one of the projects that my father and I worked on together, we were pouring kitty litter into cans of old paint so that we could dry them up enough to throw them away. We were crouched close together, seated on upturned buckets, pouring and mixing and talking about nothing important. When my mother discovered us together in the garage, she came running with her phone in hand, trying to find her camera app. Look up here, she said when she found it, pointing the phone in our direction. In the seconds that it took for my mother to press the shutter button on her screen, my father spoke some words that I will never stop hearing in my heart. If you notice on this picture, his mouth is open in, in speech. What he said was, this is a father and son moment if there ever was one. My friends, miracles happen when you put down the pieces that aren't serving you well and pick up the pieces called love and grace and authenticity 
Show up for your friends when they need you. Just be there. Don't create a speech. Don't write anything ahead of time. Don't memorize anything. Just be there. If you know someone who is searching for an anchor in the most turbulent time, I hope you'll give it to them. Because that, be that person, walk alongside them in their journey to authenticity. And then help them pick up the right pieces. Thank you. Open it up for some questions if you'd like. What is the most important piece that we picked up? I think, I think if I had to pick the most important piece that was the most instrumental in my journey, it would have been authenticity. Um, that, that word has been um, used in a variety of ways. And I think for me, what that meant was stopping the cycle of constantly looking for ways to um, to prove that I was worth it or to prove that I had a, a right to Christianity, a right to God, a right to the scriptures. And when I discovered that my validity comes from a birthright, and I could just live in my own skin, that opened up a, a, whole, a whole world of authenticity. It, 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 it affected so many parts of who I have become as a result. You have, you have an answer for what, what is the most important piece no, that is that same piece, but that doesn't make things easier because then it's like, okay, I belong, and now what? Now, begin, now begins that whole what else is in the Bible that, you know, or, or how else are we to live, and, and that begins that journey of, of a relationship with God and, and an interior, you know, Quakers are into the interior spirituality and the, and the life. You know, when you lay that piece down, there is just a whole lot of walking forward. I have one additional piece that I want to talk about, and that's grace. One of the things that I heard all around me from people who affirmed me um, in many wonderful ways, what I heard from them is how atrocious my parents were how horrible they were being and how unfair it was. That's a little bit of a, that's a little bit of a, a trap because one of the things that I learned when I was transitioning and I was living through all of that, something that many of us here today have lived through was that grace goes both ways, that they are human too. Parents try to be the best parents they can. Most parents, I would say, try to be the best parents they can. And their love and their concern, their fears, are as human as any other part <laughs> of humanity. And m many times, a parent's um, behavior and their actions are an outpouring of what they understand to be the best way that they can demonstrate their love. And so um, the fact that that can be harmful is, is still true, um, that, that some of the ways that they behave can be harmful and can, can be painful. But when I stopped accusing them and started listening to them and started inquiring about them you know there were many years where we where, where where contact between us was very sparse and someone 
pointed out to me that I was that they were not the only ones with a phone. I had a phone too. I was not giving them a chance to talk to me because I had decided for them that they weren't going to talk to me. And I wasn't going to put myself in that position. And so I didn't pick up the phone either. And it wasn't until a friend of mine said, how's your dad doing? And I'm like, I have no idea. And I don't care. Thank you very much. And the conversation ensued that, that said, you know, you only have one dad. And it wasn't until I picked up the phone and I started reaching out and we started taking steps towards each other and none of those steps was perfect. None of them was very pretty, but they were steps. And it got us to a place of healing that we wouldn't have been able to get to if we hadn't started walking towards each other. So grace is another piece that I would say has been very uh, important in my life to pick up grace, put down, put down the, the, the defenses and just say, let's take some steps. Thank you very much.